Welcome to Baylorick TV and this edition of Inside Story. We ask the questions you want the answers to. And now our host, Ingram Jones. Hi and welcome to Baylorick TV. I'm your host, Ingram Jones, and on the show tonight, Julian Jackson, the big punchy middleweight who has been known for his devastating knockout power and one of the biggest punches pound for pound in his era or in any era in boxing. Um, I've always loved Julian Jackson. Since the first day I saw him, um, and it was unfortunately against uh, Harold Graham. From that day, I followed Julian Jackson. I've got a very funny story to um, reveal in the show, as you'll hear, when I was talking to Julian Jackson. And also, two for the price of one. Yep. We got it on Baylor at TV. Julian Jackson and the son of Julian Jackson, Julius Jackson, who's now a contender and uh, doing very well in his career as well. So without further ado, I'll pass you over to my interview with the Jacksons. Hi, how are you doing? Good, man. I'm just... Uh... Sorry that the Skype is acting up, man. I know, I know, I know. It's a, it's a pain when Skype acts up, but finally we got you. So thanks for speaking to Bayloric TV. Yeah, man, it's it's a pleasure to to be on your your show, man. You you're awesome. You do awesome interviews, man. I've been listening to the the recent ones, and they've been awesome. Thank you very much. I hope we can do an awesome one too. Um, so I want to talk to both yourself and your dad. I don't know because is he around? Yes, he is right next to me. Right, okay. Can he hear? Is is a, is a, is the conversation on loudspeaker? Yeah, he can hear you, yes. Great. Uh, good evening, Mr. Jackson. Hi, how you doing, Ingram? I'm fine, how are you? I'm great, man. What I'd like to do is have a conversation, um, basically talking about yourself and uh, talking about your son. Uh, we'll start from yourself and your career. So you've had your career has been quite illustrious in terms of the amount of knockouts you've had, and the amount of power you've had, and and obviously uh, two weight world champion three times. So what does that really? feel like? What does that feel like? As far as being a a, a world champion? Absolutely. Well, man, it uh, you know it, it, it's something that is um, you know amazing. Um, you know, especially when you. Uh, you know, you didn't realize that you were going to make it that far, you know. And um, being that you love the sport so much, you know, you really don't, you know, look at it in that sense until, you know, you 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 know you accomplish the, uh, you know, the thing, and then eventually you're able to look back and say, "Wow, did I do that?" And um, that's that's how it was with me. And um, you know, up to now, um, you know, it's amazing because the Hall of Fame. Um, in New York is calling me now, uh, being that I, I was inducted into the Hall of Fame in um, in California. Wow. And uh, it's amazing, you know, And uh, but yet, you know, that's what, you know, happens when you uh, sacrifice, when you work hard and uh, when you love something and you do something because of the love of it. And uh, that's what I believe boxing uh, meant to me and uh, I loved it, I respect it, and uh, I think it respected me as well. So what was your drive? What 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 made you want to box? Um, you know, well, I came from a, a you know, a poor background, a poor, you know, um, a broken home. My mother, you know, brought brought up five of us, you know, when I was a, a young youngster. My dad wasn't there. And um, you know, I had to really fight for everything, you know. I had to really uh struggle and um 
you know, try and uh, do my best to make things work. And, um, you know, I, I think it, 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 you know, it affected me, uh, especially when I got into the, the, the sport as a young man. You know, a friend really was the one that, uh, you know, uh, I, I would say pointed me to, to the boxing gym. And, um, you know, the rest is history. But um, my friend said, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to give you a name. And, the, and he called me the Hawk. And uh, the reason why he called me the Hawk, he, he said, because everybody was running from me. Wow. And, uh, um, in, in the Virgin Islands, uh, we have chicken hawks. And whenever the chicken hawks are, uh, you know, on the move, the chickens will run. And, you know, he gave me the name, um, you know, the hawk, because the, a lot of the chickens, my opponents are running from me. <laughs> wow, it's amazing. So when yeah. you, so, so, so take me through your amateur career. What was that like? Oh man, my amateur career was, um, wasn't a, 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 a a long, drawn out thing. I didn't have 200 fights. Um, I didn't even have 20 fights. I had 17 fights. I lost two and won 15. My, 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 my two losses was against, no, uh, my one losses, my one loss was against Livingston Bramble. Yes. And uh, my second loss was when I fought in the Pan American Games in Puerto Rico, um, in 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 uh, probably in 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 the early seventies. Right. And so so I, I didn't have a very long uh, amateur career, and um, right after um, uh, I was I was training to get ready to go to the Olympics. I think it, it, it was uh, nineteen sixty-seven, seventy-six. Not 67, but uh, 19. I think it's either 76 or 78. Where boy, uh, Jimmy Carter boycotted the Olympics, and the U.S. could not pa- uh, participate in it. And I couldn't make it to the Olympics, and uh, decided to turn pro. Wow. At a very young age, uh, about 24 years old. Wow. And um, the rest is history. And um, uh, because of the love of the sport. Um, you know, I started to really, um, you know, uh, expand, and I started to really get really good. Uh, my punching power was um, uh, something that a lot of people, you know, didn't realize that I had. Yeah, they realized until, they realized it when you hit them on the chin. <laughs> yes, I, until they got hit. <laughs> uh, and, and it was just amazing. And um, um, I didn't go. I, I've never really planned to go in there to knock guys out, but. Um, because of the way I punched, because of the the, uh, the the way I was taught, the delivery, and I think I was born with with the natural power. Wow. Well, my my trainer said to me that you know he he didn't believe at the time that power was God given. He said it had something to do with speed and timing. Um, what would your um, view be on this? Because you of all people should know what it takes to be a a, a world class puncher. Um, to tell the truth, I, I I really don't believe it's speed. Okay. Um, I I know I've known a lot of fighters that um had very quick hands but no power. Right. And I I, I believe it's really um the timing, uh, the delivery, and how you you know use your body behind your fist. You can arm punch. And uh, believe me, would not hurt a fly. But uh, you can use your your entire body behind your right hand. If you throw your right hand, you want to use your shoulders, your hips, you know, your thighs, your knees, your toe, your toenail <laughs> yep. in the punch. And uh, you will be surprised how uh, effective your uh, punching ability will, um, will, 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 will will you know will actually. Um, you know, rise because of the, you know, the timing that you have, the split second timing, using your body, using every inch of your, if you're using your left hook, you want to use your left side of the body. If you're using the right hand, you want to use the right side of your body, but you have to have good coordination, good timing. And, um, uh, and I believe that's what generates power. Right. Um, 
I, you know, I've, I've tried the speed. I tried to, and uh, when I tried the speed, it took away from my power. So I, I tried to mix the speed and the power together. Mm. And uh, believe me, uh, it, it, it is tremendous. Now, there's something I would love to ask you. Now, you must see yourself in boxing. Guys who've got records of 25-0, and 26-0, and 26 fights, 26 knockouts, and they're knocking everybody out. And then they step up to that next level. In your case, you were, I think you'd had about 23 or 24 fights before you might fought Mike McCallum, I believe. Yes. And you were unbeaten and you were knocking everybody out. I was and knocking I, everybody out. Yep, yep. And um, I, I really believe I was green as far as the experience was concerned. But your power. I, I, I had the power, but I did, the experience was, was lacking. But... You, you, Mike McCollum was a seasoned veteran. Absolutely, but you say that now in hindsight. It's not the hindsight I need here. It's the it's what you felt at the time because there are a lot of fighters today that they one they're knocking all these guys out. I'm sure they believe that they're invincible. Um, you knock all yes, these guys yes. out, they fall all over. You have a, a record of 20 fights or 25 fights, and despite you not having the experience of going the distance and being taken yes, the distance, yes. you sort of feel you can That's take anybody true. out. Right, and you know what? Um, when I faced my, when I uh, actually faced Mike McCollum, I was undefeated. Yes. And uh, if it was Mike Tyson in the corner, I thought that I was going to knock him out too. Right. <laughs> so I was overconfident. This is what you I'm know? talking about. This this is really and crucial. That's exactly. Yeah. What you're saying is the truth. Because I mean, like. I saw the bout. I, I went back. I was, I, today I spent uh, some time going back and looking at your bouts. Um, and I went back, first of all, to look at the... the I looked at the Mike McCallum fight. I'd never seen the Mike McCallum fight. And I knew right. that Mike McCallum... I knew he had a good chin. So I wanted to see... The first round almost was like a Hagler and Hearns almost. You, went, you both went at it from the first round. And I saw you caught um, McCallum with some very good shots. In the first round, yeah. And in the first round, you hurt him. And I was yeah, thinking, and he went on the knee. He took one knee. Yes, and you hurt him, and the thing was, you hurt him, but obviously, with a world-class opponent and operator like that who's seasoned, what's the difference between hitting somebody like that on the chin and somebody who's less than experienced and the guys you normally expect to knock over? What's the difference? Well, I, I think the difference uh, is the experience. Uh, Mike McCollum, when I when I caught him in the um, in the early, I think it was in the first or the second round, I caught him. He took a knee. Yes. And uh, that was very smart on his part because if he didn't, he probably might have gotten hit again. Right. But he took, he took the knee, he got the eight count, and he was able to survive and recover and then come back. But um, when he came back, he came back with some very, um, I think, um, I would say, dirty tactics. Um, you know, in my song, as if I'm, 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 I'm being... Um, a little, um, I don't know, biased, but I'm not. But uh, I got a thumb in my eye. I got about two low blow after that. And um, but would you not I, I say? Was, was, would you not say you out hustled by a more experienced man? That more experienced I think man. So. Yes, I, I, I say so. Uh, when I looked at the fight, I looked over at the fight and I, I saw where um, I didn't use my head um, when I got. Uh, Tom, though, when I got punched in the eye, I should have held him, and I, I didn't. I, I, I sort of uh, continued to go forward, even though I was, uh, I was hurt, I was, you know, I was injured, and I should have um, grabbed him and hold on until I, I recovered or something. But uh, I continued, and uh, and uh, that, that basically opened me up, you know, for more of the punches that he caught. And he caught me. This did catch me some good punch. You know, some good body punch as well. And, um, you know, the referee decided that, uh, you know, it was too much for me at that time and um, stepped in and stopped the fight in the, I think it was the third round. Your development. Um, now, this isn't, it's, this isn't mean to sound um, disrespectful. More in a development stage. I'm trying to look at this not from, from, a, from a hindsight point of view rather than... Uh, hindsight's a great thing, but... I'm trying to look at this as Julian Jackson's experience being a, one of the biggest punchers of all time and knocking everybody out and then fighting for a world title and then coming up short in a world title, his first world title bout. 
do you think that if you'd fought more guys that was able to absorb your punch at that time, I don't know who you would have found at the time, but if you'd fought somebody or two, three guys that could have taken your power, absorbed your power, and give you more of a fight back, would that have prepared you more for the McCallum fight? Um, well, I think most definitely, I, I, I really believe if I had fought even more, I believe if I had fought against more experienced fighters before him, before uh, going up against uh, Mike McCollum, yes. uh, I, I really believe that uh, it would have been a different fight. But I was, like I said, I was green, mm. um, you know, and um, I, I think my lack of experience worked against me. Yes. Mike McCollum took advantage of that. And Mike, you know, I mean, I, I'm, you know, we are the best of friends right now, as a matter of fact. Wow. And, um, you know, uh, but he always said that he will never fight me again. <laughs> he said he will never fight me again. He said I hit too hard. Wow. And um, right, he said he said to me, "You're going to be a champion." You know, there is no ifs and buts about it. And um, right after that, you know, I had one um, comeback fight, and then we, I fought in Quebec in Las Vegas and won the vacant um, junior middleweight championship of the world. Wow. I heard that. Um... You made a def- you made a defense actually against uh, Terry Norris. Oh yeah, yes. Terry Norris was unbeaten uh, at the time, wasn't he? Was that? Well, Terry Norris was unbeaten at the time, wasn't he? Yes, Terry Norris was unbeaten. He was a uh, uh, very strong upcoming prospect. Yes. Uh, everybody felt that he would have uh, outboxed me, you know, because of his boxing skill, and um, you know. And uh, he did have a really good boxing skill. I, 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 I studied his tape. Many of his tape, I looked at him. You know, and, um, I realized that um, once you keep the pressure on him, um, he's, he's going to definitely make mistakes. He's going to drop his hand. And that's what we went in there to do, and uh, to put the, keep the pressure on him. Because if we didn't, he would have outboxed us all night. Yes. And um, uh, from the very first, we, uh, 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 Bell, I went after him mm. and I kept it up and kept it up and eventually uh, my opportunity came and I took it and, uh, beautiful right hand from... beautiful right hand it was a peach of a punch um, I, did, I do notice in all your bouts you t- like to take the centre of the ring you take control of the centre of the ring and you come out bombing you don't give uh, opponents the opportunity to get themselves into any sort of rhythm and any sort of uh, uh, time to get themselves, get their jab working. You're right on them from the start and landing bombs heavy, which I think very unfairly. Um, I read a few things on box rec, not even, not only in box rec, but people say, "Oh well, Julian Jackson was a was a big puncher. He could give it, but he could never take it." Now I yeah. mentioned that going into the next fight, which is Jerome McLennan, um, and you fought the G Man, or, or not your next fight, but when you had to move up to middleweight. Because I I do remember you mentioning somewhere along the line that you were too small, or, or you were you were a light middleweight, but there was nothing in the light middleweight division for you, and the real challenge right. were in the middleweight division. Yeah, my, my power my power really my my power basically um, I, I think gives me the um, the um, the ability to move up in weight. Yes. Okay. My my, my punching ability was. I think the thing that basically kept me, you know, in that, you know, in that higher weight division, and um, it worked out pretty well for me, um, you know, and, and there were some really big guys in, in, you know, in the middleweight division at that time. Yes. You know. Um, how did you make, how did you, the transition from light middle to middleweight, what did you need to do? Because I know you could say, "Well, I ate," but you know, you came. You always look. You came to shape, looking in great condition. What did you need Not to really. do? Um, I, yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't eat that much. Um, you know, as a matter of fact, there were times I I had to, I had to, um, you know, basically um, time myself as far as training. Right. Um, if I train too much, I will get too light too quick. You know, weight wow. was no problem to me. Because I was a, I was a, I mean, a, 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 I mean, a, a junior middleweight was my weight. Right. 160, 
was um, the times I had to stop training at, uh, for a couple of days, you know, take a little break, you know, and um, don't push myself too much because um, I would lose the weight too fast. Right. And um, there are times I would have to drink more than I usually would drink, but it, it was difficult because once your body is accustomed to something, you know, it, it's hard to try and change it. You know, um, it was hard for me to really try and change my uh, appetite and uh, because when I'm in shape, I can't eat a certain amount of food. Um, and, um, you know, that, that I, I think that was something that um, I had to mentally uh, cope with. And, uh, but my punching ability took up the slack, you know, right. um, as far as my weight was concerned. And, um, but, uh, I met somebody that, uh, could have punched, uh, like myself and was, uh, a, a lot bigger than I was. And that was, uh, Gerald McLennan. Wow. McLennan was, um, he, he was touted for many big things, Gerald McLennan. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, um, in, in, in my uh, first fight with him, mm. I knew I could have, you know, beat him. I knew I, w- I would have been able to beat him. I had him out. I had him. Um, as a matter of fact, the corner, his corner was, was, he was crying for his leg and that he couldn't deal with it. And uh, I knew I was getting to him. Uh, I could see it in his eyes just like any other fight, you know. And I think I got a little too anxious. Um I got a little too anxious. I don't I, I, if I remember well, it was either the sixth or the eighth round. Yes. And and uh, I mean, I was going in for the kill. And you got, I got a little that fight. I remember. I dropped my my defense, and boy, Joe McCannum caught me a right hand. Uh, I'll never forget him. <laughs> he caught me a right hand, and um, that was the end of it. That was the end of it. I, I tried to hold on. I tried to do everything. But just couldn't get my 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 legs, you know, under me, and um, you know, and hey, uh, it was a tremendous fight, and um, you know, I, it taught me a lot, and uh, you know, to to lose a fight, you know, at that caliber and that time of my career, you know, was was kind of tough, but you know what, I persevered and I came back, and I won the title again. Yes, I do. I know you, you won the title. For, I thought that was the second time, was it not? Yes. Um, and I won, I, won it in, I, won it, I won that in um, Boston against an a Italian guy. Yeah, was that, the one, was that the one you knocked out with a left hook? Yes, yes. I remember watching that fight as well. Um, yes. the, fight, the fight for me that really caught my attention, I watched you on... I think it was Sky Sports when they were introducing your career. When you, I couldn't remember the very tall gentleman you fought was in the first round, and they were introducing you as this big puncher, uh, and you're world champion. And you, th- you went out there with this. I couldn't remember who the opponent was, and you threw a left hook in the first round. You knocked this guy clean out. And I remember oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the reports and the thing. I thought, wow, Julian Jackson. I'm gonna have to look out for this man. I'm gonna have to look out for this man. So that's how I got to know you. Um, you know, I, I want to mention a, a fight that um, I will never forget. A fight that I fought in Spain. Harold Graham. Um, against Harold Graham. Right. Harold Graham I was just about to go on to that fight. That fight. He was, man, he was, he was a sofa. He was the most awkwardest opponent that I've faced. That I've ever faced. Hmm. And, um, I mean, it was like. Um, I didn't study. I didn't get to study much on him. Didn't get to see much tape on him because he was from, you know, the UK. Yeah. And um, the fact that uh, we went in there, and um, I also um, moved up in, in. Well, that's that's when I was uh, fighting for the the middleweight. Yes. Yeah, that's that's when I won the middleweight. Yes. Well, my first. Um, that's when I stepped up in weight class, right. and he was he was very big, he had strong legs. Oh man, and he was a salpa. And uh, boy, in the first two rounds, uh, in the second round, he caught me a, a punch, uh, a left hand in my eye, and my eye just uh, it didn't swell up right away. But when I went to my corner, I blew my nose, and my eye blew out. Oh boy! 
<laughs> like a balloon. <laughs> and um, my trainer said, you shouldn't have done that. Don't blow your nose. If you get hit in your, your eye, don't blow your nose because it, it, it will cause your uh, eye to swell up. Okay. And they had to press it as hard as they can to squeeze the air out of my eye. And um, the referee came and said, uh, 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 the referee said, it, it, you know, you got to be careful. I'm going to stop the fight. Your eyes don't look too good. Okay. It's closing Cortez. Said I will close it. I will shut. I will stop the fight. So I decided to switch. I decided to switch to the softball stand because uh, 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 he was softball and he was catching me all the time. And when I switched, um, then he came right in. Uh, he was coming for the kill, and I saw the opportunity and I threw, I threw a actual right hook. I remember the right hook. And caught him right on the chin. Mr. Jackson, at this at this moment in time, I am about 12 or 13. And I'm on my bed, and I'm eating popcorn. And I never thought I'd get the opportunity to say this to you. But at this minute in time, as that punch lands, I'm biting the popcorn. I miss the popcorn, and I bite my tongue. <laughs> I slip my tongue, and blood is pouring out of my mouth. <laughs> so thank you, Mr. Jackson. I fully appreciate that. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. So when you threw that punch, I believe it was in Marabella, or Marbella, yes? In Spain. Yes, Marabella, Spain, that's right. Yes. I remember it because I remember the whole thing with the British Boxing Board of Control. And you, I also remember at that time you were wearing these dark glasses and they said that you couldn't see very well. And that's why the fight never yeah. happened in England. Was that true? Yeah, that was true. Um, we couldn't fight. We couldn't, um, the fight couldn't um, take place in England because of my detached retina. Wait, so is that, uh, now th- what I heard was that you were half blind. That's what I heard. What's the truth? No, um, no I'm, I'm not half blind. Um, basically, um, I'm nearsighted. I was nearsighted. Uh, but um, without my glasses, I can read very well. I can see very well. I don't Near. Okay? I don't right. need glasses. I don't need... To read. to read. I don't need glasses to read, you know, but I had the operation on my eye. Right. And that was a concern that, um, you know, I was impaired and um, all of that, but uh, that wasn't true. Um, I, I mean, um, I drive without glasses. I do everything without glasses. But, you see, um, that's, what, that's what the media does, Mr. Jackson. The, 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 the media build things up and they tell you, oh, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Julian, Julian Jackson, he's blind. He's, a blind. he's close to blind. And this fight really should not be happening in England. But they've staged a fight in Marabella in Spain. So they're making a fight. And they made a big thing about it. And I remember watching you, these big glass, these thick black glasses. So, of course, the image on TV, God, these guys are <laughs> blind. And, and I, I see you getting peppered by, by Harold Graham. Peppered, peppered. Peppered. And of course, in Britain, you're here as a UK, in the UK, and you're a UK fan, you're thinking, Harold Graham, this is the opportunity for him to win the world championship. You're there, and you're watching this guy, you're thinking, this is Harold Graham's chance. You're going, go on, Harold, go on, Harold. Go. And the next thing <laughs> I know, my tongue, my, my tooth hit my wow. tongue, and bam, the punch landed. And I, that, that punch will forever stay in my mind. Um, it was a ferocious punch, and. Uh, you yeah. didn't bite your tongue that time, right? Pardon? You didn't bite your tongue. You probably might have bitten it off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like that. <laughs> oh, and that's the only boxing bout that's ever happened. And I've been watching a lot of boxing. That happened when I was 15. I'm now 36. <laughs> wow. So uh, thank you once again. So, yeah, the Harold Graham fight. Wow. I, I also noticed that Harold Graham, he threw, I think it was a uh, two straight left hands at you the first left hand he threw it was almost like he he was premeditated he threw the first one and as he was about to throw the second one then you caught him with the right hand yeah 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 
Was that more instinct? I'm to set him up because I think he, he realized that when I switched, he knew that my eye, you know, was affecting me. So he figured that he was going to come on that opposite side. When I switch, he had to, to try and come over to the opposite side. Right. And it opened him up, it opened him up for me, and, um, and uh, the rest was history, man. I caught him wow. in that. And, and you killed him. So after that happened, what, what happened with Julian, Julian Jackson then? What's that? I didn't get you. Well, after that fight, after the Harold Graham fight, then what happened? Oh, man. Um, I mean, uh, the heavens opened up. Okay. You know, all kinds of things started to happen. Um, uh, back home in my, in, in my native country here in the Virgin Islands. Yes. The name of, of a street after me. Wow. Oh, man. Every, I mean, they give me the, 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 the keys for the city. Uh, all kinds of things uh, started to happen. And, um, but the number one thing that I wanted to really do, uh, wanted to happen was I, I was looking for a multi-million dollar payday. Okay. Don King. Right. And um, I struggled and I fight with him. I fought with him tooth and nail. And, um, you know, it was always promises, promises, but it never took place. So what was so what was it like to be with Don King, such a big promoter? So many different stories about Don King. What was, what was your relationship like? Well, and you know what? I, I, I'll be honest with you. Um, you know, I've, I've I've made more money with Don King than I've ever made with anyone else. Um, a lot of promoters wanted to get me, but um, Don King was a very shrewd businessman a very shrewd businessman and um uh, he wouldn't let he wouldn't let a dime you know or a penny you know pass by him but um i'll be honest with you um i felt that um you know i i was supposed to be paid more i felt that um that uh that thing didn't give me uh i, I believe what i was worth but still um I was able to make more than I've ever made, you know, really. Um, I must say, even though uh, Chavez and Mike Tyson, and I fought on the undercards of these guys, and, um, these guys uh, basically used to tell me, man, you know, you deserve this and you deserve that. You deserve more than anything else, and you need to be on your own card. But it just didn't happen. And, um, you know, that's, that's one of the reasons why, you know, I fought, Tooth and nail with Don King and trying to, you know, get me a, a million dollar pay a day, a multi million dollar uh, contract. It almost happened with um um uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the fighter. Um, I, it almost happened with a, a guy by the name of um, Roy Jones. Uh huh, Mr. Roy Jones. Yeah, that's when he was in his. That's when he was just coming up. And um, it was promised that, um, you know, I would get a fight, but it it, 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 it fell true. I was I was supposed to fight um, this guy by the name of James Tony. James Tony, yes. Yes, I sat down on the table with, 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 with his promoter, Bob Arum. Okay. Dan King and myself. How did you find Bob Arum? Huh? How did you find Bob Arum? How did I want? How did you find dealing with Bob Arum? Well, um, they found us. Um, people were asking for the Terry. I mean, the um, the um, the fight with me and uh, what's his name, James Tony. Yes. And the public wanted to see that fight, so they decided to sit down and make that fight. Right. And um, I signed the contract for eight hundred and fifty thousand. Okay. And then I. Signed it, pushed it over. James Tony took the pen, and then all of a sudden, a phone call. A phone call comes in, and Bob Arum told him, "Wait, oh, wait, wait, wait! Don't sign yet." And James Tony, manager, is on the other side of the phone, and said, "If he signs it, she's gonna sue his drawers off of him." Jackie Callan. Yes, and um. 
right after that phone call, uh, Barbara hangs up and says, um, I'm sorry, Dan, we can't find. And uh, Dan King said, don't worry, uh, we'll get, we'll get a, a, you know, somebody to fit in with the same price. And that person was Roy Jones that was supposed to fill in. And he called Roy Jones. Roy Jones' father was managing him as well as training him, training him at that time. Right. And he calls Roy, uh, Roy Jones' father. He said, um, you know, he spoke to his father, and he said, hey, how would you like to fight for, uh, you know, six digits figures, uh, 850,000? He said, sure. You know, he tells Dan King, sure. And, um, you know, uh, Dan King said he spoke to um, Roy Jones himself, himself, and Roy Jones said, man, this is an opportunity, man. And um, his dad said, who's the opponent? And Dan King says, Julian Jackson. And his dad said, who? <laughs> his dad said, Julian Jackson? Julian Jackson hits too hard. <laughs> I can't take that fight now. I can't take that fight now. And he literally pulled out the fight and closed the door. You know, the deal was dropped. Wow. And um, didn't get the opportunity to fight for that. It, I, I believe if I did have that opportunity, things would have been a lot better for me. How do you think you would have fared against James Tony and, and Roy Jones? What's that? How do you think you would have done against Roy Jones and James Tony? Um, I, I tell you what, I, I think I'd have knocked out um, uh, James Tony. Yep. Here's some thoughts about it. I know I'm going to knock him out. Um, Roy Jones, being that he was green, and his father, you know, they were very skeptical. And at that time, uh, Roy Jones, very flamboyant, very, you know, quick, fast, and just like Terry Norris. I would have done the same thing, you know, uh, you know, pouring the pressure on him. It would have been a heck of a fight. I'm going to mention two names to you. Uh, well, one name in particular, a fight that I would like to see you with, Nigel Ben. Do you know Nigel Ben? Oh, boy, yeah, 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 no, yeah Nigel Ben. Um, the Dark Destroyer. Boy, I had a lot to fight him. What, who, I, I wanted to fight um, a guy by the name of um, Mugabe. John, Mc, John the Beast Mugabe, oh my God, yes, I remember him. And he did not want to fight me. Uh, he fought, um, as a matter of fact, he fought Terry Norris. Yes. And Terry Norris knocked him out. Yes. And Mugabe gave uh, Marvin Hagler fits, didn't he? Oh, he gave Marvin Hagler a good fight, yes. Yes. Marvin Hagler, oh boy, he gave Mar- Marvin Hagler a tremendous fight. How do you think you would have done against someone like Marvin Hagler, Sugar Ray Leonard, Thomas Hearns? Oh boy, Sugar Ray Leonard. <laughs> that was a, a big disappointment, man. Um, Sugar Ray Leonard said he would fight the winner of me and Terry Norris. Wow. <laughs> That's it. That, that... I, I knocked out Terry Norris, and he decided to fight Terry Norris instead of me. <laughs> I went to the press conference. When they were uh, getting ready to, you know, to, to, to televise the fight, I mean, to broadcast the fight, I was there. Dan King threw me in and said, Julian, you know, you deserve to fight um, for this fight. Uh, this fight will take you over. You know, this, this is a million-dollar payday. Uh, you need to, to go in there and start to, you know, demand this fight. I went to the press conference, and I said, man, this is not right. You said you wanted the winner. I won the fight, and now you're fighting the loser. <laughs> what did he say? And the media was eating this up, and uh, Sugar Ray Leonard said on the mic in this uh, press conference, he said, Julian, I'm going to be honest with you. You hit too hard. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh boy. And that's the man that's fought Thomas Hearns as well. I mean, I could not believe it, you know. I could not believe that Sugar Ray Leonard actually said that. Wow, that's a, that's a great he, compliment. I, uh, I don't know if anybody recorded it, but uh, uh, he said it in the public. 
in the press conference. And he said, Julian, you hit too hard. Wow. And I said, man, you know, uh, it was just that. But, hey, you know, that's how the, 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 the ball, you know, rolls sometimes. But I'll tell you what, I believe that my son are going to go farther than I've been. Wow. Already they're, they're ahead of me. You know, when I was uh, 12 and 0, you know, I was still fighting for uh, $100 a round, you know, way back then. Wow. You know what I'm saying? But they have television. They, they've been on television be- already. And um, I got on television when I was maybe like 20 and something. And, you know, wow. that's when I really started to get a name. But here it is. They are 12 and 0, you know, 13 and 0. And they, they've already been on ESPN. Uh, you know, and we have something coming up, as a matter of fact. Um, we're going to be on the ESPN show on um, in March. Excellent stuff. In Las Vegas, yeah. Wow, I definitely, I do, I want to focus, I want to focus on Julius more in a moment. But just one more question yeah. I want to ask you, or two more questions. Question sure. number one is, um, there's a fight coming out. I'm not sure if you heard about it. Roy Jones and Steve Collins. What do you think? Roy Jones and Steve Collins. Yes, uh, Steve Collins is coming out of retirement. Steve Collins is now 48 years old. Wow! Did you not know about that? I didn't know. I didn't know. I'm, I'm, I'm first time I'm hearing it. Um, Steve Collins. Wow! I, I think that um, <laughs> I think Roy Jones uh, is gonna gonna knock him out. You think I so? I think Roy Jones has have been in uh, you know after his you know his his upsets and uh, losses and uh, setbacks, but yet he's still been busy. But um, Steve Collins, I've, I've, I've never heard, you know, of any type of comeback that he's made. No. Maybe he has. I don't know. He but, hasn't. Um, he hasn't. That's a tremendous risk. He hasn't. He hasn't. He hasn't. You know, um, and, um, you know, it could really, uh, it could really damage him. Really, but I think, he should, uh, you know, I, I, I can't understand why these guys would come back and uh, want to go right to the top rather than. You know, getting a couple fights, you know, to build them up and then fight the big fight. Well, I guess Colin, Colin says the reason why he's coming back is because Roy Jones, he believes Roy Jones was a coward and said that, um, he said Roy didn't want to fight him back then and he ducked him. Roy Jones responds and says, well, wh- I, how would, why would I be scared of you if I went and fought the heavyweight champion of the world? So it's been some back and forth for years. And so Colin says, yeah, okay. let's deal with it. Let's get it sorted once and for all. So he decided to decide to get it on. Yes. So they're just going okay. for the negotiations, but Colin's back in training. So you think that Colin's will get knocked out in this one? Um, yeah, I, I, there's a possibility. If, if, if Colin's have, maybe he may have been secretly training for years, I don't know, since he's been off. And um, But uh, if his people, you know, if it's just a, a, a money, you know, get rich, get quick scheme, I don't know. Uh, let, let, you know, let's let's do something. Let's make some money. I need some change. You know, maybe it could be something like that. But uh, if not, and Steve Collins might, you know, have some tricks of his sleeve. I don't know. But um, I believe there's going to be. I, like, I understand there's going to be some I mean, sort of belt on the line in the cruiserweight division. That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> There could be what? There okay. could be a belt on the line in the cruiserweight division. Oh, okay. So okay. It's, a, it's a cruiserweight fight. Roy Jones says he'd like to win the cruiserweight championship of the world. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's basically history in the making, and uh, these guys would just like to get in the a history book and make, you know, I got six belts, eight belts. You know, some guys just like that, you know. You okay. Know, just get in there and uh, uh, make history. And, um, and you know that's what it could be too, you know, because we are, I mean, we are athletes, and um, athletes just love the, you know, I, I guess the the, the 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 attention. We love the the opportunities to go out there and uh, show the the people of the people of the world that you know we, we still have it when really you know, uh, you know, Mother Nature keeps you know calling and. Uh, <laughs> You know, there's nothing you can do about it until you get, you know, a punch in the chin. And then you and find you out. 
and then you realise yeah. maybe you shouldn't have made the decision you made. Right. <laughs> well, on that point, when did you re- when did you realise it was time to quit? Um, my last fight was in nineteen ninety six in okay. Las Vegas. Okay, um, I fought a guy by the name of, let me see if I can remember his name. Verno Phillips? Pat. Yes, right. Vernon Phillips. And, um, you know, I, I somehow I felt, you know, even before I went into, the, in, into that fight, you know, I said, you know, I think this is going to be my last fight. And I felt that. And uh, being that I'm, I'm a man of God, I'm in ministry. Wow. And um, I felt that God was was telling me this is it and um I really meant it and um believe me, um, you know, I, I think I made the right decision because Vernon surely did speak to me. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah. Well you know when you go in the ring and you're already talking about retirement, is there a part of you that is not with you when you get in the ring? No, I don't think so. I, I just think it's it's a reality check and uh, sometimes we want to come out with a big bang and we want to come out looking good. You know what I'm saying? But also, yes, mentally, there may be, you know, um, effects, you know, that, that you know that, okay, your time has come and, um, you know, you, you start talking that kind of talk. It says a lot, you know, your body is going to also react to your what you're thinking. And, uh, and that, you know, that, that may have happened to me. When you retired, was there any offers to come back for one more last hurrah? Oh, boy. Several. Several. And um, I, I said, no way. I turned them down and said, uh, no, not me. Um, you know, I'll be in the ring, but I'll, I'll, be, I'll, be, in the, I'll be in the corner uh, as a coach. Anybody you know, in particular fight. Anybody in particular that you were tempted by or were offered? Um, yeah, there were a few promoters that uh, tried to get me back. Okay. You know, you know guys from Vegas that I knew that was uh, coming up and... Uh, you know, I, I guess they figured, uh, you know, there was a guy that actually had um, the white buffalo. I don't know if you ever heard of the white buffalo. Yes. Yeah, and uh, he was from the Ukraine. Uh, they wanted to push me to give me all the plans and the money that they would, you know, invest. And uh, they would give me a $1,000 every uh, month and blah, blah, blah. But I said, you know what? I'm be honest with you. Um, I've made up my mind. Uh, I'm gonna enjoy my, my 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 family, my kids. I got my right mind, and uh, you know um, I I'm gonna you know I'm gonna come back, but not not um, as a fighter, you know. Right. Um, yeah. Um, directly, I'm not gonna be involved. But indirectly, and um, I thank God that I followed my my spirit, and um, now I'm you know I'm, I'm coming back, but I'm coming back in the shadows of my son as a coach. So this this moves us on to the old Superman saying the son the the son becomes the father the father becomes the son. So I I like that. You like that? Yeah. <laughs> so so now it's now Julian Julian Jackson the coach and Julius Jackson. Julius, are you there? Yes, sir. I'm here. Hi, Julius. So now I've given the background to your father for people who didn't know who your father was. And now I can yeah. talk a bit to you so your dad doesn't steal the show so much. <laughs> so how I are was, you, I Julius? Was myself. I was intrigued with that interview myself. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, so well, so your father now is, is your coach? Yes, yes. Him and uh, my uncle as well, uh, who was his main Sparring partner. They're both my uh, head coaches. Okay, so what's your record? Right now I'm 14 and 0 with 10 knockouts. Okay, and what division are you in? I'm in the super middleweight division. You're in the super middleweight division? Wow, and how tall are you? I'm about 6'2 and a half. Oh, 6'2, six 6'2 two. Six two and a half. Okay, okay. So you've got a little bit of height there then? Yes, yeah, I do, I do. Well, your, your dad was around 5'10, right? Yes, yes. So, so your <laughs> so so your styles would be different, I I assume. Yeah, I'm a, a little different. My I, style's a little different. I watched a couple of your fights on tape. Uh, one fight in particular, 
Uh, the one where the uh, gentleman is going at you from the first round, who's throwing those overhand rights and trying to uh, get you and, and both you fall out of the ring. Can you explain to me more about that fight? Oh, yeah, that, that about uh, actually a memorable, about, <laughs> a memorable one for me. Um, yeah, the guy, a lot of guys that I fight um, start the bouts like that. They really uh, rush me and uh, try to get inside uh, from early. And, um, you know, that was his game plan coming into the fight. And, uh, you know, I just try to move, use my jab, and try to stay outside. But also, I wanted him to respect my power as well on the inside. So I would throw, throw a couple of hard shots in between. Um, but um, going into the second round, you know, he kept rushing me. And the, the, the ring wasn't built the best. I, they, I think they had new ropes, and the ropes stretched out really quick. So um, they kind of were really flexible and bendy. And uh, we ended up going over the ring right onto the ring girls. And, um after that, I got really upset at that point. I was really upset at the, the fighter and how his, his style, the way he was fighting me. And um, I just started to, to trade with him, and, and, and he quit. He quit after the third round. So. Wow, wow, wow. I believe it's a, it's, it's in the ESPN uh, rankings, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I actually made – actually, the next day, they came knocking on my hotel room and said, yo, yo, you're on ESPN. I'm like, you're on ESPN – Top ten. I was like, nah, stop playing. He's like, yeah, you're on ESPN top ten. I was like, okay, cool. We we go in the room, we wait for it, it comes back on, and it, it was actually the ESPN not top ten. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I was like number three. <laughs> well, I'm sure your your dad obviously made uh, ESPN probably ESPN top ten for uh, knockout of the year or, or one of the best knockouts of all time. Yeah. <laughs> so in terms of uh, punch power. I, do you think you've got something that what your dad had in sort of power? Do you think you've had to be more of a boxer rather than a puncher or boxer puncher? Yeah, I think I think I've inherited a little bit of it. Um, I definitely feel my brother has more of that natural power, but I definitely have uh, inherited some of it. Um, but my style, my style is definitely more of a, a boxer. A boxing style. Uh, I love I love throwing combinations. I love throwing more than one punch. Uh, I love mixing it up. It, mm. it just feels really good and natural to me. And uh, so that's really what I do. But you know, guys have been crumbling under my punches. So I, I do feel that I do have a little bit of, of what he what he's got. <laughs> I mean, uh, I've noticed that the guy, the shorter guys, like to, obviously because you're taller, these guys like to get inside and have a fight with you. So. Um... There's a tendency for these guys to to get you involved in a brawl, um, yep. and obviously test your chin early. What's your response to this, and how, how do you feel as a fighter? These sort of opponents come at you all the time. Well, I my 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 coaches don't really like this too much, but I I love a fight. You know, I, I'm kind of like a Mexican. They call it they call me a Mexican sometimes because I love to be in that fight trade and feels what he's got so I can give him what I've got. And um, so when, when guys do that, sometimes I get the tendency to, to stop boxing and just to stay there and trade with them, which I'm very good at, which guys don't really expect um, from me because I'm so tall. Yes. Um, but I'm very good on the inside, and I, I hit really hard on the inside when I when I decide to sit down on my punches. And um, I, I love doing it, um, even though the, the shorter guy might have a little bit more of an advantage because of, of his leverage. Yes. But, um, I'm I'm very well inside. I I can handle myself inside pretty well. Right. I mean, you talk about uh, your nickname is the the chef, I believe. Yes. Yes, it is. Where does that come from? Um. Yeah, that's another one of my passions. Uh, I love to eat, and <laughs> I love right. to <laughs> I love to create food. And <laughs> so, um, I actually, as I was uh, getting ready for the Olympics, I was in culinary arts school, and I, I graduated uh, with my associate. And uh, I worked for the Marriott Corpor Corporation for about three or four years. Oh, wow. Uh, so that's that's one thing. I, I love food, man. I love to cook. So Great that's stuff. why they call me the chef. <laughs> wow, fantastic. Um, so you said that you were preparing for the Olympics. So you fought in the Olympics, did you? Yeah, yes, sir. In the 2008 Beijing Olympics. And how did you do? Um, I lost in the first, the first uh, qualifying round to uh, the silver medalist. Well, actually fought, I actually fought in light heavyweight. Uh, because we already had a middleweight for um, our country. Okay. Um, so I fought a middleweight, 
and I, I, I lost against Kenny Egan, who was the silver medalist in okay. Beijing. Okay. Still, yeah. how did you feel? Obviously, you didn't get the result that you wanted, but what sort of experience was that going to the Olympics? Oh, man, it, it was a tremendous experience. Uh, not only did, uh, you know, me and my brother, we got, you know, we got to that level in such short notice. Uh, we only had about 30, 30 fights at the time. Um, it was a tremendous achievement to do it. Not only to do it, uh, you know, just to, to do it, but I did it in a weight class above what I usually fight. And, okay. Uh, it was tremendous. Yes. Wow. Yeah, those European fighters are, and are so so much different. They they fight such a different style, and it was great to experience it. Wow. And, um, Absolutely. Yeah, it was, it was big time. It was big time. Um, Biggest accomplishment in my life so far. Um, because you're as tall as you are, six two, do you struggle to make the weight at the moment? No, no, not at all. Uh, I actually was gonna fight at one sixty, but um, my dad is like, nah, maybe that's a little too much. We just stay at one sixty eight. So, uh, no, nah, one sixty eight is very comfortable for me. Uh, not not too much drying out. Not you know, I don't have to dehydrate too much. So, how do you that. how do you deal or how do you cope with the fact that you are the son of you know, uh, Hall of Fame, Hall of Famer, uh, big punching, three-time world champion, and father Julian Jackson. How do you deal with that? Uh, it's been pretty easy to deal with it. Uh, I just kind of accept it, and um, my dad. Uh, I think because of him as well, it, 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 it we don't feel pressure. You know, he, he he's really down to earth. He's really you know just a, a normal guy like anybody else and he he mm. behaves that way and he never puts pressure on us he never puts us you know in a position where we need to be like he is or be to his level you know we just be ourselves and he he's he's okay with that well, I was, and um, that made that's made it easier from you know from the outside it's easy inside so any pressure we get from the outside it doesn't really uh, affect us at all i would say you're very blessed there because there are parents <laughs> that do put a lot of pressure on their kid to be the best they possibly can be. Pressure to the point where it's uncomfortable and almost abusive. Um, You hear so many stories of uh, parents pushing their child's career because of their own personal Mm -hmm. ambitions. And uh, obviously, it's it's great that you've got a a situation where your father is a lot more hands-off and allows you to be whom you want to be. But I have to ask the question... Obviously, you're in the mm-hmm. trade of boxing. Your father was an ex-world champion. Did yeah. it ever happen that Julius Jackson and Julian Jackson got in the same same ring together and sparred? <laughs> yes, yes, we have. Uh, he, he was my toughest sparring. He was. He was. My toughest sparring ever. <laughs> I know. I know. Until, until, okay. <laughs> until we reached a, a certain point where um, I think this was uh, maybe I was maybe about mm, sixteen, yep. and um, I had actually missed a day of sparring uh, during the week, so we went to spar on Saturday because I had a fight coming up. Okay, so it was just me, him, and and his wife, who is my stepmom. Right, and we were in the gym and we put the gloves on, we went sparring, and I think in the third round uh, I hit him a straight right to the body, and he curled up and then stretched out on the floor. So I was like, Dad, you okay? I went to touch him. He's like, Don't touch me, don't touch me. <laughs> <laughs> so, he took a simple press, he got up, and he's like, All right, let's finish. I was so, like, Okay, I won't hit you the body. He's like, Just hit me. Don't, don't worry about it. And we finished, and then he's like, All right, I'm never going to spar with you ever again. So, so <laughs> there was never any situations where your dad maybe got a flashback of the early 90s where he was knocking out Terry Norris when he was sparring with you, and suddenly he got a flashback and he sort of try to land that same left hook on you or that right hand, was there no moment in time that your dad tried to be a bit over ambitious with you? No, nah, no, nah, he never um he never gave us none of those knockout blows. He was careful not to do so. Uh he did what he did use was his quickness. Like we could never hit him. It was so frustrating how he was like, Dad, I hope you're not trying to do because he would just use his experience and be slick and we would never be able to hit him. Wow. Until we started to kick up, you know? So well, that, that was what we hated. That was I, what we hated about it. I guess it, it's, it's the, the, it would be the an excellent tool for you to learn to keep your hands up, eh? 
Oh, definitely, definitely. Wow. My, my uncle, my uncle though, he didn't have mercy. Uh, he he was my dad's main farm mate, and so whenever my dad would knock farm mates out, they would call my uncle, and <laughs> he was like the secret weapon. Oh, and, right. uh, <laughs> my uncle, man, my uncle, he knocked me out. He knocked me out with a body shot. Oh boy. And through the ropes, he knocked me through the ropes. He grabbed my gloves with his gloves on. I don't know how he did that. He grabbed me, picked me up, and said, "Let's go. You got to keep going." We went again, and then he knocked me out again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wow. My uncle showed us no mercy. <laughs> wow. But I guess that I guess that's the way you're going to learn, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Never been down since, so <laughs> I did learn <laughs> Wow, great memories. Um, so now, in terms of your career moving forward, I believe you've got a fight. You're talking about having a fight in March? Yeah, uh, we just had a meeting uh, this evening with the promotional team, uh, uh, we, I think we're going to be on ESPN Friday Night Fight on uh, oh, March 8th. I, I forgot to ask you, who's your promoter? And your, Who's your promoter? Uh, we have a local promotion. Uh, okay. Free Fall Boxing. Uh, my dad is the vice president of that. And um, we have two other, three other members on the team. Um, Tony Rosario and Leslie Comision. And also, you might know him very well, Samson Lewis is uh, part of our team as well. Okay, okay, okay. Do you know what would be great? What I'll do is uh, if you send me the details, I'll put it on the actual in, in on the show so people can see where, how to contact you and stuff like that, you know, and, and what awesome. we're up to. It's be fantastic as well. Awesome. Do you, know who, do you know who your opponent is by any chance? No, not yet. Uh, I, I can't wait to find out. Um, but no, we, we haven't heard any names yet. In terms of knocking people over and stuff like that, what do you feel like at the moment? Does it make you feel... Because I spoke to you, obviously I spoke to your dad earlier, and you were there when I spoke about, you know, him going out and knocking all these people out, and then when he got to his world title fight, he found himself to be green. What are you going right. to do to learn from your father's mistakes or his lack of experience? What are you going to do differently in your career? Uh, well, definitely in the gym, uh, we definitely concentrate a lot on that and, you know, being prepared for anything. Um with our sparring, you know, with my brother and my cousin, different guys that we spar with, uh, my coaches are always uh, making us do different situations so that we can be prepared for any any type of fighter, any type of level, uh, and especially on the on the pads. And um, we kind of try to simulate different styles. My my dad would change to a southpaw or you know do different things so that we can uh, be prepared for any type of fighter. Okay, and, uh, that that's what we're counting on, you know. How old do you know the super middleweight division? I know it pretty well. Uh, <laughs> In terms of, uh, of you got Andre Ward. You, you obviously know who Andre Ward is. Oh, definitely. Okay. Then you've got Carl Froch and Mika Kessler going to fight again. Who do you think is going to win that? Abraham. Yeah, all the green. Yep. Mika Kessler and Froch. Who wins? Kessler and Froch, who wins? Yes. Mm, this is a rematch, right? Yeah. I'm going to have to go with Kessler again. I'm going with Kessler too. I'm going with Kessler by knockout. Oh, by knockout? This, I, by I don't knockout. know. Archie's, Archie's got heart, man. I know he's uh, got heart, but um, I'm going to go with Kessler, Kessler by... Kessler, I think Kessler knows. Kessler's got his number, man. Kessler is too much of a boxer for his crotch. So, uh, You're going yeah, Kessler. I'm going to go with Kessler. I don't know if he's going to go by knockout, but... I got Kessler to win, though, yeah. Okay. Um, have you seen the, the other UK fighters? Um, James DeGale? DeGale, yeah. And George Groves? I, I'm i not familiar with Groves. I might have seen one of his fights. He fought James DeGale. Um, he beat James DeGale on points. Controversially. Yeah, this is a rematch, isn't it? Yes, it is a rematch. They, they want to have a rematch. They haven't fought yet. Yes. They fought once already, but they want to fight again at some point. De Gale is uh, yeah. just vacated the European Championship, and George Grove is fighting for European Championship now. So, okay, okay. So uh, it'll be interesting. So, in in some at some point in the future, I'm sure that you'll be in the ring with one of the, some of these guys. Oh yeah, I can't wait, man. <laughs> okay, do you have a message for any of your fans before we finish? Um, yeah, just you know, look out for me. Uh, you know, I'm, you know, hit me up. Call me, whatever. You know, I'm very open to, to speaking to anybody. 
you know, and look out for me. I'm a, I'm a true boxer, and I was going to bring, you know, heart and and always bring a good fight to the ring. Uh, I'm very true to the sport, just like my dad was. So uh, that, that's what we're going to do. And uh, I won't disappoint, man. The chef won't disappoint. The chef be grilling them in the ring, man. <laughs> <laughs> and, chef, what's your uh, Twitter? What's your t- how do we find you on Twitter? Uh, you can just follow me at Julius the Chef one on Twitter. So repeat that for me again, please, so they heard that. Yes, Julius the Chef one. Excellent. And Facebook page, Julius? Yes, Facebook is Julius Jackson. Just Julius Jackson, straight. Excellent. Julius Jackson and Julian Jackson, thank you so much for talking to Bayloric TV. Man, it's been a pleasure, man. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, me and my dad are, are, are stoked that you contacted us, and we we appreciate you, man. You do you do a great job for the sport. Great Thank job. you so much, and I look forward to speaking to you just before you fight, and obviously after you fight. Oh yeah, man, I, I would love it, man. Just just hit me up. No problems. Thank you so much, Julius. All right, man. Take care, brother. Thank you. Bye bye. There you have it. Uh, an interview with the big punching Hall of Famer Julian Jackson and his son Julius Jackson I hope you enjoyed the interview (laughs) I hope you enjoyed uh, laughing at my expense at the end of the interview as well and with regards to myself and Julian Jackson um, it was really an interview where I've got nothing but admiration for the man a champion in and out of the ring and now a coach for his son and uh, I wish Julius all the best as well thanks to Julius Jackson for making the interview possible uh, we struggled a few times to make the interview possible uh, we had a lot of technical issues but we got through it in the end and uh, yeah so big, big shout out to the Jacksons thank you very much for making the interview possible I look forward to following the career of Julius and talking to Julian again this is Bayloric TV we ask the questions you must want the answers too. I'm out.